I am Zara Amer, and this is The Change, a podcast featuring stories about women, technology, and the Anthropocene. This project is an experiment, one that seeks to draw in an ever-growing climate conscientious public by starting and sustaining a mature, informed, and thoughtful conversation about the reality of climate breakdown while identifying the most impactful and scalable technologies that stand to considerably help the environment. The podcast is hosted by my friend, Antoinette Wilson-Marcus. Antoinette and I have received tremendous support from our partners and distributors, which we are very grateful for, and we are very excited to be bringing these stories to a broad audience. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. Hello, everyone. Our guest on today's podcast is Dr. Heather Jones. She's a research fellow at Project Drawdown and a consultant on the circular economy at the World Bank. She previously worked as an associate editor for the Encyclopedia of the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a chief construction economist. Heather specializes in econometric forecasting, data modeling, sustainable project evaluation, cost-benefit analysis, life cycle assessment, and accounting for environmental impacts. In this week's interview, I will talk to Heather about how she defines transformative adaptation, the SDG business opportunity, the promise of smart cities, and the economic and personal costs associated with the mass production and excess consumption of electronics rooted in planned obsolescence and a throwaway culture. Without further ado, I now give you Heather. Thank you, Antoinette. Here are my thoughts on transformative adaptation. I live in Paris, and I was there during the first lockdown in March of 2020. Pont de Mirbeau is within my one kilometer radius for daily exercise. I have walked the Allée de Signe, or the Swan Walk, that ends there, many times over the five years that I've lived there. There was always a pair of swans near this bridge. They were certainly charming and a reminder of when Louis VIII populated the island with swans. However, they were a bit dirty looking, especially the lower part that's under the water. It was completely gray and a completely different color from the top part of them. They also appeared kind of lethargic. Less than a month after the initial lockdown, the swans began to look cleaner every day on my walk. They appeared to be more active as well. The river looked clearer and cleaner every day too. There were no boats in the river and no cars on the bypass that goes along it. It was very odd to see a carless and boatless Paris, but it was also very peaceful and quiet. This happened all over the world, with pink dolphins returning to Hong Kong, goats in Wales, wild boars in Barcelona, lions on the road in South Africa, and flamingos in Mumbai. The Himalayas could be seen from a distance for the first time in 30 years. Build back better became a mantra. So we have the motivation. And we still have the opportunity for transformative adaptation. Everyone wants to see clean, happy swans. We were, and possibly still are, at the tipping point for widespread demand and willingness for action for transformative adaptation. Disasters such as the global pandemic, recent flooding in Germany, Belgium, and China, and the heat waves on the west coast of North America have been called an opportunity to introduce transformative adaptation. Some think that transformational adaptation is the last resort of a failing system. Others think it is a positive opportunity to consciously design a response. I think that here and now, it's both. The current linear system has clearly failed. We have a problem, climate change. We have some solutions, and most politicians are on board. How do we harness this and go forward? We must create awareness and buy-in and to make champions for the cause. Transformative adaptation is the intersection of science, policy, and implementation, which is carried out through all levels, individuals, businesses, governments, NGOs, and universities. It is systems thinking, all actors within and across sectors. It is proactive, not reactive, and is a system or a paradigm shift. We have been slowly moving towards transformative adaptation since the Paris Agreement in 2015. I can give you all definitions all day long. Instead, I'll tell you that transformative adaptation to me 
means that we accept the reality of climate change, and we must adapt ourselves through a major transformative shift to the way we consume and produce. The resurgence of wildlife and clean air and water from lockdowns, plus the recent flooding and the heat disasters, have brought climate change and the need for adaptation to the forefront. People, consumers, they're aware. Businesses are aware. And a lot of governments are open to making changes. Transformative adaptation is across all sectors and all actors. So let's begin with all actors. We have young champions in Greta and Clover, among others of all ages. Businesses are adapting, such as Loop for sustainable packaging for groceries. And most governments are involved, from Paris, Amsterdam, Brussels, London, among many others that are setting the bar. And transformative adaptation must occur across all sectors. So for transportation, for example, it means not just buying an electric vehicle, but clean energy for the grid to power. But let's go a step further for true transformative adaptation to occur. What about not buying the car at all and using public transport? Or buying an electric bike instead if you don't have good public transit? How about the government making it a priority to shift away from car use? Even further, what if we all decide not to own things? Teens are not getting driver's license, which means not using it and buying cars. Seoul is striving for a true sharing economy by sharing cars, bikes, tools, books, toys, even physical space. They're encouraging multiple generations of unrelated people and households. Transformative adaptation is needed to achieve our climate goals and keep our air and our water clean. It's good for the environment and good for the economy. That makes for happy people and for happy swans, too. Thank you, Heather. I like your reference to swans, and I like the very personal story that you tell us. I wonder if, though, I could start by reading you an excerpt from the Good Tech Lab report and then asking you something about that. In the Good Tech Lab report, it says, technological breakthroughs and new business models can be instrumental in addressing wicked problems. However, innovation alone should not get all the credit. The high-quality replication of the best ideas also deserves some. Project Drawdown attempts to balance both met- methods by featuring 80 existing solutions to the climate crisis and also listing 20 potential game changers. So I'm wondering if we could start our discussion by looking at the imbalanced reporting that exists in the climate debate around innovation and replication. We hear a lot about the importance of innovation. We need new solutions. We need more. That There's this perception that we don't currently know how to solve this problem. But the sense I'm getting from what I'm reading of your work is that actually we have a lot of really useful solutions already, and we're not implementing them necessarily as well as we could. Project Drawdown breaks away from that cultural norm, and you don't seem to fetishize innovation. What I think you're saying is that we can reach drawdown by the mid-century if we make the best use of all existing climate solutions and we don't need to wait for further innovation, that now is better than new and society is well-equipped for transformation today. So the question to you then is, going back to that excerpt, does the high-quality replication of the best ideas deserve some or even all of the credit for the game plan to get us to the target of staying within one and a half degrees Celsius? Absolutely, this is about replication of existing solutions. Innovation does have a part, but we have proven that you can actually reach drawdown using only existing solutions. The ones that we cover are proven and they exist and they're scalable. They're currently available, they have proven potential, they have sufficient data, and they're financially viable. So a lot of people think that when looking at these solutions that it's politically unrealistic that we can actually reach drawdown using what exists. Uh, But we've proven that it's physically and economically realistic. Uh, There's a path forward. The question is how to bring the physical, economic, and political possibility into alignment. Um, For example, one of our solutions is electric cars. These already exist. Um, A solution that we do not have is EVTOL, which is like electric and vertical takeoff and landing. Think drones for cargo, and banned and unmanned air taxis. Um, It's not a solution yet because it's not available wide scale, although it might become one in the future. The first Evtal urban airport is being built in Coventry right now. But it's not that's not even true innovation either. We already have the technology for the electric engine, electric motor, 
And we already have the technology for the vertical with helicopters. Um, so these are new applications, but, but there's nothing completely innovative. Some of the solutions that I would highlight would be that the two largest uh, are very non-technical. <laughs> uh, it is health and education, which mm-hmm. is um, educating women and providing uh, access to birth control uh, and education about it and reducing food waste. So that begs the question then, why are we not doing more with the technological solutions that exist? Is it just about government policy not supporting adequately? Is it about the consumer not having enough information? Is it that the information is there, but the behavioral change isn't happening? Where's the gap between what exists and why it isn't driving sufficiently what we need? Or is it just a timing issue? Is it coming? It's a little bit of all of that. The way that we've done things in the past is we've kind of built a lock-in. And especially, um, I talk about transportation infrastructure a lot. That's what I'm most familiar with. We have locked ourselves into a car-based society. Uh, the infrastructure is there for the cars, uh, the gas stations that exist, parking lots, uh, minimal parking spots that you need to build things. That's that's all locked us into that. But we are shifting. There is a transformation occurring. Places like Norway have banned internal combustion engine cars starting from 2025. But in order to do that, we need to build infra- infrastructure to support that. So there needs to be charging stations that aren't that aren't there currently. You, have, you end up with some range issues with that. So policy is changing, and consumer, which will help influence consumer behavior also. So there needs to be a framework within which the consumer can switch from their dependence on a particular technology, i.e. combustion engine vehicles. The will is there, but if you don't make it easy for the consumer to do, and I guess food waste is, is, a, is a similar problem, or the use of single-use plastics in supermarkets, People are aware that those things need to change, but if you don't make it easy for them to do that, then they know about it, but nobody does it because it's just there's a, the barrier for behavioral change is too high. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And a lot of it, too, is a, a bit of a lack of awareness. There's the ugly fruit movement where mm-hmm. to not throw away for grocery stores to not throw away ugly produce. We've we've become addicted to, you know, the apple has to be perfectly round and shiny, and it doesn't need to be. A, a misshapen apple still tastes as good and still works just as well and gives you as many nutrients as an ugly one. Okay. So you talked about transformative adaptation, and you used the word scalable, that we already have solutions that um, that work, that are proven, and that are scalable. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you drive bigger impact and wide scale replication? How, how do we get to that scalability? Who helps? Is it other organizations? Is it government? Is it the public? Is it a combination of all of those? It's everyone. It's, uh, it's everyone. The, the consumer has to demand it, which will put pressures on businesses to provide it. And the government and policymakers can help drive some of this through awareness campaigns, um, subsidies, policies that make recycling easier, the help with waste management, things like that. So could you tell our listeners who may not be familiar with the work of Project Drawdown, how do you as a, an organization, an entity, what is your role in, in that process? Where do you fit in the life cycle of raising awareness and or being an activist or driving change? What's Project Drawdown's role in this life cycle? Project Drawdown, um, is a broad organization, in a sense. Um, there is a, a group who is tasked with coming up with the solutions and proving them, uh, doing the science behind it, coming up with the emissions reductions, the cost structures, and that's 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 one piece. That's creating the solutions that can be published and talked about. Um, then there's a few other groups that are more focused on bringing it to businesses to helping with the scalability. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's Departments that work across, uh, that are regionally focused, that help work with different parts of the country and other countries. And there's a part that um, is beginning to work with uh, shaping policy. 
So that's quite interesting because within your organization, you have people who focused on very different stakeholders and participants in this process. So as someone who's quite interested in organizational behavior, to what extent do you find that it works well within the organization? How stitched up and joined together is your organization at driving in the same direction, achieving the same goals? Or do you have the same problems that everybody else out there has that, you know, you have specialists who focused on a particular area and it's they're siloed. It's really hard to get everyone to talk to everybody else. We have a, a wonderful group of very passionate people mm. uh, and we do work together well. Uh, we The Drawdown Labs, um, which is talking about the scalability and replicability, isn't possible without the scientists that work on the solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the solutions don't get the attention that they need if you don't have the drawdown labs. Um, so it's a very symbiotic organization. Okay, so that's great because what you've got in Project Drawdown then is a kind of microsystem that shows that it's possible for people with disparate stakeholders and with potentially competing needs and interests can actually work together towards that common goal. Um, and that that in itself could be a, a working model for how society as a whole can think about this in a more holistic way, in a more systemic way, instead of just saying, well, motor vehicle users have their representative who lobbies government for motor vehicle users. But people who are interested in sustainable transportation or driving us towards alternative means of transportation or use more use of public transport, instead of seeing those as competing or conflicting interests, we can see those as a more systemic and whole position. And we can, we can work together because you demonstrate that in Project Drawdown, how different and disparate agendas potentially can work together. Absolutely. And we've done a great job with that. But also, I've done some work uh, with the World Bank on the circular economy. And what I've really seen there is some cities are doing a, a really good job with this also. Um, Paris, uh, Amsterdam, Brussels, uh, they all have meetings within the whole different departments. I mean, some of these, like Paris or in London, they're huge. Um, and I think they have like 36 different departments that all come together and talk about how they can help each other mm -hmm. to achieve circularity and how everything's interconnected and it's a system. Yeah. So that, that must be very encouraging for you. Yes. I, it's, I hope that it, I hope that it starts being replicated <laughs> all over the world. So when we talk about drawdown review in scenario one, where total gigaton of CO2 equivalent reduction is 993.8 lifetime profit amounts to $15 trillion. I know you talk about a slow math breakdown of how Project Drawdown can reach a figure like that. Could you talk to us a little bit about bearing in mind that I and probably many of our listeners are not economists or mathematically minded? Can you explain what that means to us? The first thing that I'll talk about is uh, that it comes from several, the 80 solutions. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the biggest ones are health and education and reduced food waste. Uh, the other really large ones are plant-rich diets, refrigerant management, tropical forest restoration, onshore wind turbines, and alternative refrigerants. Um, so each of these ha has calculations that are done in order to uh, quantify the emissions reductions. Um, so what we do is throughout our analysis, um, the total amount of CO2 reduced or sequestered is based on the number of solution units. Um, so the number of new wind turbines installed or the number of new electric vehicles. So these, these number of solutions that are active between 2020 and 2050. Now, the first cost that we talk about refers to the cumulative cost to purchase and install the solution units. In other words, and how to, the cost to implement it. And the lifetime cost is the cost to operate those units throughout a lifetime of use. So then each solution's impacts and costs are then compared to the current practices or technologies that it replaces. Another thing to keep in mind is that we also integrate the models within and across multiple sectors. Um, this allows us to consider how the ensemble of solutions might work together. 
um, reducing emissions, sequestering carbon, and moving the world towards drawdown. The integration of the models uh, ensures that resource constraints are accounted for. So you can't have a solution uh, that's bigger than the amount of land that's available for it. We check to make sure it avoids any double counting of impacts from overlapping solutions, that you don't double count electric bikes when you talk about e-bikes and then bicycle infrastructure are two separate ones. Also, addressing the interaction between solutions where possible. Um, we increase the demand for electricity from electric vehicles or electric heat pumps. Uh, and then after integration, the results will total to determine uh, if and when we reach stall down and at what cost. So to bring it to a more usable level, uh, I will talk about public transit. Uh, and so when we when we make the calculations and the emission instructions for this, we do it from a user perspective, not from the owner or operator. Um, and solutions, all of our solutions have different agency levels. So some are from the bicycle infrastructure, for example, is from the city level. So it's what they would pay to build the bike lanes. Okay, so public transit's from the user perspective. So annual urban passenger kilometers globally are roughly about 33.6 trillion kilometers per year. And that's going to rise to about 56.4 by 2050. Uh, public transit's about 30% of that. So we estimate every single passenger kilometer that is made using public transit instead of a car in the future. So for right now, we're talking about just operating costs. So it doesn't include purchasing a car. So cars require fuel, maintenance, and insurance. Uh, the user doesn't pay any of these to use public transit. The only cost to a user is the price of a ticket. So when you amortize these costs over a kilometer or a trip, the costs for a car are 28 cents per kilometer. And public transit cost is about 14 and a half cents per kilometer. So when you take this difference and you multiply it over the roughly 9.3 trillion kilometers annually that are made additionally through public through a push towards public transit um, over what we would what the standard level would be, what we call the reference case or business as usual uh, with public transit instead of a car. And, and there's some background calculations in the background also, but um, it makes 31 trillion in lifetime operating cost savings for consumers. Uh, the same goes for emissions. And Metro, a piece of public transit, is the least emitting mode per passenger kilometer uh, at a certain occupancy. So who consumes that information from you? That message is, who's, who's that targeted at? Well, it would be targeted at consumers, obviously, to make the switch. It's uh, less expensive for you. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. You should do it. Also at the municipal level uh, for the people that are building it. If they can understand that they can provide a service which helps them provide uh, access, accessibility. It can help with equity for you, for users in the city. Um, the equity and the accessibility uh, and the circularity of cities is becoming something that cities are really striving to uh, in order to be considered competitive. Does climate change cause more intense hurricanes? Why is Tyson Foods so bad for workers and the environment? How can vaccine distribution prioritize the Black and Latinx people who've been most vulnerable to COVID-19? Will pickup truck drivers go for an electric Ford F-150? Fans of this podcast might also enjoy God Science from the Union of Concerned Scientists, featuring guest experts who answer a range of science-related big questions. Available wherever you get your podcasts. What needs to drive what? Is it behavioral change from the consumer that will push policy change and infrastructure development to support easier options for consumers? Or is it, so is it push or pull? It has to be both. It has to be a, a push from policymakers and some businesses are even pushing. It's got to be a pull from consumers. Uh, which gets pulled to the to the businesses, um, which can sometimes even pull then to the into the um, policymakers. So it's it's a kind of a top down and a bottom up from all actors and all stakeholders. 
And do you think the message of reduced cost per kilometer is more powerful in driving consumer behavior change? Or do you think there are other aspects to behavior change and the messaging to the consumer that need to be considered? Cost is always important to the consumer. Um, However, we're getting to the point where people are beginning to make decisions not just based on cost, if they can. And right now, it's a prime example, um, public health. People have actually stayed off of public transit during the global pandemic, worried about spacing. But the good news is internal combustion engine cars did also did also go up also um, as a proportion of the modes traveled. Um, but walking increased, bicycling increased. I mean, bicycles sold out all over the world. Uh, and these are conscious choices to be more active and healthy and also to be better for the environment. Right. So there's a combination of messages here. There's, I'm looking after my health and well-being by being more active. I'm also doing my bit for the environment because I'm using a mode of transportation that is much more environmentally friendly and emits fewer carbon particulates. I'm saving money. And not necessarily in that order, but it's a kind of a, a bag of drivers that, that's going to drive that. Exactly. And that's kind of where this whole 15-minute city concept comes in. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. Yes, um, some cities are pushing that, um, like Paris, for example, um, so that people can live where they work and work where they live and play. Amsterdam's also done a very, very good job at this. It's So the closer you are to everything that you need, the less you have to travel and the less emissions that you have. Heather, you also talk um, a lot about the throwaway culture, and you shared in the beginning in your um, definition of transformative adaptation, the the notion of the shared economy and where cities like Seoul are driving consumers towards um, not ownership, so sharing of transport, sharing of cars, potentially, not buying things, sharing books, sharing even space you talked about. So could I explore a little bit more? with you, your thoughts on the throwaway culture and specifically the economic and personal costs related to mass production and excess consumption, particularly of electronics. So my question is, how do we fix the problem of planned obsolescence and excess consumption? Is it regulatory? Is it at a manufacturing level? Is it changing the way in which goods are manufactured so they're not, there's not planned obsolescence? Or is it about changing mindset so that we tap into the the zeitgeist of the youth that is moving away from the need to own things towards a more shared or rent economy. That's a, a great topic. It's actually it's one that I'm very passionate about. Um, this covers a lot. Uh, so first of all, talking about the disparity between uh, the global south and the global north, 45% of the world's uh, carbon emissions are generated by only 10% of the population. So that's kind of amazing. Um, in order to get away from the throwaway economy, we're looking at a couple of different regulatory options there are to begin with. So you mentioned an iPhone being planned into obsolescence. Um, then they have a new phone every two years. Uh, you know, the iPhones actually contain over half of the elements in the periodic table. Uh, so they should definitely be allowed to be upgradable. Um, and repairable. Uh, sometimes the battery is not replaceable. The software stops being supported. So one of the first ways to do this is through extended producer responsibility. And this places uh, the onus of the end of the life of the product on the producer. So they are responsible for recycling it or repairing it or reusing it. In the news recently was the United States new right to repair executive order, which these are all related. Um, the European Green Deal has uh, the EU circular economy plan, which includes a circular electronics initiative, which goes along with this new sustainable products policy framework that they have. So there's an eco-designed directive that's aimed at making devices that are designed for energy efficiency and durability, repairability, upgradability, maintenance, uh, reuse, and recycling. So we talked about, I just talked about the U.S.'s right to repair. This is also part of the legislation in the EU. So a recent study of EU respondents um, done by the European Commission showed that 79% of the people thought that manufacturers should be required to make it easier to repair a a digital device. 
two thirds of those respondents, so 66%, would keep using their current devices as long as the performance wasn't increased, does not decrease, uh, which also includes, like I said, the applications of the software no longer being supported. Uh, some of the problem too is that a lot of people no longer use their devices because they get a new device offered from their providers for free. Uh, another topic we roughly touched on was um, like access over ownership. So we think people should be able to use what they need when they need it. So they can get this either through product as a service or a peer-to-peer -peer market. For product as a service, uh, there's a lot of different ways can we do this. Um, there's subscription services. Uh, they are, this exists for things all the way from Philips in the EU is doing um, light bulbs as a service. So you don't actually own your light bulb. You just pay for the use. Uh, and then there's peer-to-peer -peer markets, which is a lot of what we were talking about in Seoul, um, which is everybody sharing the same. Uh, in Sweden, they have um, these things called smarter cartons, which is a map. And it's these neighborhood sheds where there's all sorts of consumer goods that you can borrow. Uh, and you just check it out like a library. You just check it out and return it. So talking generally about smart cities, as they relate to the circular economy and transportation, can you speak to the rollout and take up of transport-related smart city narratives and interventions around that in cities beyond the EU? Yes. Um, so smart city or circular city transportation, uh, as I mentioned before with the 15-minute cities, is having working where you live and play all, all related and all very close together. So in a truly circular or smart city, uh, people would not own cars. Uh, you would share them when you need them. There would be a, a wide variety of public transit available. Uh, there'd be bike sharing systems. And one of the things that's not often talked about when we talk about transportation in cities is the cargo aspect of it, the freight. So we all know we should buy electric vehicles for, for personal cars and, and share them. Um, but we, we now live in an economy of uh, Amazon where we get everything delivered uh, the next day, in some places even the same day. Uh, so this puts a huge pressure on the freight system and uh, can be very high in emissions. So we need to figure out how to control that. Um, one way is to downgrade the size of the delivery vehicle as you get closer and closer into the city. So outside of the city, using rail is, a le is less emitting than um, putting it on a diesel truck. Uh, electric trucks are difficult right now uh, for range issues, but alternative fuels are coming in to some parts of that. And then once you get to the city, there, we should encourage pickup spots. Uh, it doesn't have to be at your door. Maybe you could walk down the street to pick it up. The cargo bikes, electric cargo bikes, uh, with lowering emissions, um, they can go into places where cars cannot. They don't take up nearly as much parking. Uh, these are all very important things for policymakers um, and users to think about. I think you make a really good point to, when we talk about transportation, it's not just about the commuter's transit to and from home, work and leisure, but it's also about the transportation of goods and products into those centers. It's about food deliveries and all the other consumables, which we're also talking about getting them to do less of. But in the interim, there are still always things that people will need to buy and that will need to be delivered. And so um, it's about also thinking smart about how to address that issue with, with, within the circular economy cities. Is this a theoretical conversation at the moment? Or are there places that are actually doing this, putting this into action yet? I believe it's Brussels um, that worked with TNT, a uh, freight provider, and they have this um, new system where it's a, a big cargo. I like to think of it kind of as the mothership, <laughs> um, where it has all of the the uh, packages and freight and consumer goods on it, and it goes in parks near the city and electric vehicles like cargo bikes, um, small electric cars, things like that come and get the packages. Um, and then they don't actually, they try not to return with empty loads either. 
to get more packages. They they try to encourage people to drop off their returns at the same place where they can pick up um, if they if they're not getting it directly to their house, and so they take those back to the mothership uh, and then pick up their next load and go to where they need to go. So I'm going to go then to to this question. Talking about the Paris Agreement, in your opinion, are we going to be able to limit global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius this century? I'm hopeful. I, I think the tide is turning, that um, things are changing. The lockdowns that came from the pandemic have shown people what it, our cities can look like without all of the traffic, without all the commuting. People, they're calling it the, uh, the great resignation. Uh, people don't want to commute anymore. They don't want to go back to, to their jobs. Uh, they would if, either have a hybrid of work from home and some go back to the office. So I think we're, we're seeing behavior change. Uh, and people were, were able to actually see what happens in a very visceral way when you s- lower pollution. So uh, I, we keep s- stressing that the solutions are there. Uh, we just need consumers to choose them and demand them. And we need policymakers to help provide the, the infrastructure and the access that people need for them. I'm also quite interested. I know that from previous conversations you've had with us as we were coming into preparing for for this podcast, we talked about gender equity and we wanted to understand whether Project Drawdown and its research fellows has equity for in terms of gender. And I thought, certainly was quite interested by the answer to how many of Drawdown's research fellows are men and how many are women. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how you experienced gender diversity at Project Drawdown. So there's a, a couple of different measures um, uh, for Drawdown as a whole. And I haven't done the math on that, but it is largely dominated by women. Um, and then the fellowship cohorts, depending on who you include in them or which not, at least nine out of 11 them, nine out of 11 are women. That's unusual, isn't it? It is, and it's by design. Interesting. It, when the number one uh, number one solution to achieving climate change is health and education, which is focused mostly on women and equity, um, it's nice to see that they practice what they preach. Absolutely. I want to just tease out a little bit more about that because you have mentioned this um, element of Project Drawdown's focus on women's education um, and health and well-being for women as a, as a very significant part of the opportunities and the solutions going forward for zero um, emissions. Why are women so important? What, why is women's education so important? As education for women increases, uh, which also includes uh, education and access to family planning, uh, fertility rates tend to drop. And so you you have fewer demands on resources when that happens, and you have uh, people contributing to society in new ways that wasn't there before. Right. So it's not just about, I mean, it is partly about having fewer people on the planet, having to access limited numbers of resources, but it's also about the quality of their participation in the economy and in in the future sustainability of how we live our lives, either in urban or rural settings. Yes, uh, and urbanization is hugely fastly growing in the global south, and increasing education for women is where the next whole entire cohort of innovation is going to come from. Um, and we said that the path to climate change can be done with existing solutions, uh, but there's always room for innovation. So let's tap into that little piece a little bit because we've talked a lot about existing solutions and we haven't really touched much on the innovation piece. Where do you see the next wave of innovation coming? What's almost there but not quite that you have visibility of through your role? Reduce demand <laughs> for transportation, uh, as we keep I keep talking about, uh, which is not exactly an innovation. So... Well, I guess it is an innovation if it's something we're currently not doing and haven't figured out how to achieve, right? Because the innovation is in how are we going to get 
people to reduce their demand. And activists and innovators and entrepreneurs are definitely the start, especially for for women. Uh, but we need scientists and researchers and politicians and CEOs and board members to to also make this happen. Uh, so the education um, globally in the global south everywhere is 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 really important. Heather, I'm going to give the last word to you. And what I'd like to invite you to tell the listeners of this podcast, what would you, what message would you like to leave them with? Given what we've talked about in terms of the hopeful scenarios you see for the future, you've shared your vision for a best possible future world that's achievable or realistic within the next 20 years. What's the message to listeners of this podcast, either as individuals and consumers, or even possibly policymakers or government officials? What's the closing message for them? We can do this. We can achieve our climate goals. There is a path forward. Uh, it's now is the time to act. Everyone needs to do their part. We need to make conscious decisions um, on how we consume. Uh, it's up to producers and uh, government policymakers to help guide that, to help uh, to help us produce more sustainably and economically viable. We uh, everyone has has their role to play, and I it it, it it's proven it can be done uh, with existing solutions and it's economically viable. Thank you very much, Heather. That was really fascinating. I hope everyone enjoyed listening to you as much as I have. And thank you for giving us a hopeful window. We have something we can aim for. Thank you, Antoinette. I enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for tuning into our very first series. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe. And since we're a new show, please, please, please circulate our information with your friends, family, and colleagues. Extra points if you subscribe and throw us a rating.